All right. Hello, and welcome to the 2019 uh, accredit Public Library Accreditation and Community Needs uh, Workshop. I am Krista Porter. I am the Nebraska Library Commission's Library Development Director. And I handle, uh, obviously, accreditation, library accreditation, uh, public li uh, librarian certifications, uh, E-rate, many, many other things at the Library Commission. <laughs> Um, in, our, in my department. Uh, but today uh, we are going to talk about public library accreditation and community needs response planning. Now some of you are up for renewal for your public library accreditation this year in 2019. Uh, some of you I believe are up not until next year and that's fine. It's great to get a head start on this whole process. Uh, some of you may be directors or staff at libraries, board members. That's great to have as many people as possible uh, up to speed on everything that we're doing and that you might need to do related to accreditation. And I know some of you are brand new. I've talked to some, some of you and some have done this before, been through this process in the past. Uh, hopefully uh, with everything we go through today, everybody will be um, know everything you need to know about being accredited to the Nebraska Library Commission. So those of you who've been through it before, this may be somewhat of a refresher. Hopefully for the new people, it will be good, um, a good introduction to it. So the Nebraska Library Commission does do public library accreditation, and we have all the information for this on our website. You have also been given a handout um, I sent you ahead of time, which is also available on the session page for today's workshop. Uh, the presentation materials. You can use those to follow along with some of the things we'll be doing today. There's also this new article that I just put up there. I, I apologize, I've forgotten to get that out to everybody yesterday, but it's here online, an article about something that was done in Hartford, Connecticut at their public library. Don't worry if you didn't read it ahead of time. It was not, there's no pre-reading requirements for any of this, um, but I did want to get it out there um, as well. Okay, everyone. Now on our website here, we have um, a menu on the side about the public library accreditation and certification programs that we have here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And they're all together because they are all related. Um, I'm gonna start um, just down here at the library accreditation section so we can just talk about the basics of that and then some of the things that lead up into it. So the Nebraska Public Library Accreditation Program, this is something that we run here out of the Nebraska Library Commission. Um, this is not something that is a national program set up by um, ALA or IMLS or other national organizations that all states do. Uh, it is specific state to state. Some states do not do public library accreditation, do not do uh, librarian certification, things like that. Um, but here in Nebraska, years ago, they did decide this is something we did want to do. Um, so why why do we do this? Why is the, what is the purpose of a, a, a library accreditation? Um, and you can see here on the website we have some basic information about it. Um, really, it's a good way of setting some standards for libraries, basic standards of things we think librarians and libraries should be doing or could be doing to provide really good service to the, your communities. Uh, there's bragging rights involved with it, of course. We are accredited, and we are accredited at whatever level that we are. Um, you can compare yourself to other libraries and see what they are doing, um, how their accreditation levels are. And there are some peer comparisons that go on in the process as well. So you can see certain libraries and how you compare to them. Uh, this is good to bring to any stakeholders or funding people to show if you might need more funding or more support um, or more staff or something in a certain area, you can show. Uh, look, here's how we are doing and here's how this other library similar to us is doing. And you can speak to them about, you know, what might need to be updated. There is also uh, money involved in this. That there are certain things that you need to be accredited for. Um, you need to be accredited in order to receive the funds. Uh, one of them is our state aid payments. Uh, and this is something that actually we just posted um, recently. I think it might be on the next screen of our blog. Um, we do state aid, I'm gonna just look that up here. There we go, state aid. Um, every year, libraries who submit their public library survey to us are then um, given um, funding. There's uh, dollars for data for everyone who just submits um, the survey. But if you are also 
um, accredited, you get state aid, and then depending on what level of accreditation you are at, there's three different ones that we'll talk about, you can get a little bit more money in each higher level. So you can see state aid is based on the population of your service area, and the basic one for the smallest libraries um, that we have is $565 plus 0.06 cents per capita. And then if you are at, um, that's your basic uh, bronze level, and then if you are at silver or gold level for accreditation, you get a little bit more. I think it's about 200 or so dollars more. So this is just straight up money you get that you can do whatever you like with. Um, there's no restrictions on them, no requirements that you meet any criteria or anything. This is just state funding that we get that because you are an accredited library, we will pass on to you. Uh, in addition, we have grants here at the Nebraska Library Commission that we offer. And on our website, we have a link here to lots of information about grants, but with specifically what I'm talking about right now is over here, eh, over here are NLC related grants. Um, in order to apply for any of the grants that we offer through the Library Commission, your public library does need to be accredited. So continuing education grants, that's training grants for attending workshops or conferences or events or um, bringing someone into your library to do a presentation. Um, internship grants, if you're going to receive an intern to work at your library and we will provide a stipend for them, you need to be an accredited library. Um, youth grants for excellence, that's our, um, training, our grants for teen or children's services. And where is the one I think? Oh, um, library improvement grants, there they are, for um, uh, building improvements or sometimes for programs, uh, major projects you might be doing. Um, so in order to apply for any of those grants that we offer here via the Library Commission, you do need to be accredited. We also have some other grants that are listed here, our Library Innovation Studios project, that's the makerspace equipment we're putting into libraries, um, our Sparks grant, which is for connecting schools and libraries with internet, um, those also, as the grants that we hand out, you would need to be, had to be participated in those, which are already set with the libraries. Um, you would need to be accredited as well. Also, other organizations have also decided to use our accreditation program as one of their requirements for their grants. And that's what we have listed down here under the under other funding sources. Community development block grants, these are through the Nebraska Department of Economic Development. And libraries can apply for these, and they are listed under public works, actually. So your community, and on, for the benefit of your library, could apply for a grant through, excuse me, the Nebraska um, Development Block Grants, the CDBG grants. But you do need to be an accredited public library if you're going to go for one for your library. Also, jumping down to the USDA Community Facilities Grants, same thing. Uh, they are for uh, facilities and public bodies, um, libraries are, um, your city would prov uh, provide, uh, submit this, and um, they also list libraries here somewhere. I know I've seen them. Um, there we go, libraries. So educational services. But your library would need to be accredited to apply for that one through the USDA. And then lastly, um, we show here the Kreutz Bennett Donor Advised Fund um, grants. Um, these are grants, uh, Shirley Kreutz Bennett uh, was an educator here in Nebraska and when she passed away, she had a lot of money she wanted to donate and she specifically wanted her money to go to libraries. So through the Nebraska Community Foundation, she set up a fund. This is specifically for the smallest libraries. You just have a population of fewer than 3,000 to start with. Um, and then you can get funding. There are actually three different types of grants that they offer. And one of them is actually a planning grant, grant to become accredited. So if you are a library that is not accredited yet, this is a grant you could apply for, for to cover any costs or expenses you might incur um, to become credit, accredited. Uh, things like if you need to attend a workshop and need someone else to cover the library while you're out, uh, you can uh, get a, a grant from them, you get money from them that will cover the salary of that person. Um, if you need to set up internet access or your online catalog or um, anything, you know, any subscriptions you might apply for, oops, um, one, you know, the first time getting signed up with Overdrive or other uh, group things, um, anything you might need to do that's here on this list, things that would either help you work on your accreditation process, getting started in the first place, or earn you more towards your accreditation, uh, you can get a grant for it to become accredited. So that's a little helpful one for non-accredited libraries. 
But after you're accredited, they have two other ones, an enhancement grant specifically for programs and services, and then a facilities grants for anything in your building. So upgrading, um, fixing things, um, new construction, whatever needs to be done. Um, so for both of these, the Kreitz Bennett facilities and enhancement grants, you would need to be accredited. These are all matching grants, one-to-one -one matches. So if you ask for uh, $500 from them, you'll need to put in $500 towards whatever your project is as well. So in addition to just being able to say, hey, we're a great library, we've done awesome things, and look at all we've done about with being accredited, you can also um, get monies. You have the ability to apply for grants that you normally would not have if you were not accredited. Accredited. So um, it's really a measure of the quality of your library services and you know showing how great you're doing. A lot of libraries like to um, you know, mention it. Um, you'll also get a little window sticker from your system, original library system that you can put in the window of the library. We also have now um, online badges that you'll be able to put. We can give you the uh, file for that, post on your website, uh, your Facebook page, anywhere online that you want to, showing off, showing that you've, you've earned your accreditation. So that's, there's a lot of good things that can come, good reasons to be accredited. Now the process begins every year um, officially on July 1st is when you can start working on the application form itself to either become accredited or to be, get um, re-accredited if you're new, renewing. Um, but right now, at any time, you can start working on gathering the information you need to do that. Uh, working on your community needs response plan, the actual extra document that we'll talk about. So July 1st, you'll get an email from me uh, telling you if, if you have done your public library survey, telling you, hey, you're being invited to start the process. Uh, so there are some other some basic requirements before you can even start your accreditation. First thing being completing the public library survey and the supplemental survey that we include along with that. Um, this is something that starts in the fall. Uh, I believe it went live in November and just wrapped up in February. Uh, Sam Shaw here at the Library Commission is in charge of that, so you get emails from him. And once you've completed your survey, that's the, the basic thing, the thing that you have to be, have done, and then we will invite you to um, become accredited if you never had before, um, or work on your reaccreditation if you're up for that. Uh, the process, um, you get accredited for three years, so you need to be reaccredited every third year. Uh, so you won't, this is not an annual thing that you have to do, <laughs> this is something you do this year, and then you don't have to go through the process again for another three years at the moment. Then there are our 12 minimum qualifications you have to meet as a library, basic things that we think libraries should be doing before you can even start. So think, some things you absolutely have to have and we'll get into those. And then a whole separate document, the Community Needs Response Plan. Um, this is an actual, um, as I said, a separate document that you will email to me. It is not an online form. It's not something that you fill in the blanks, something or anything like that. Um, that's a separate uh, thing that you'll write up and send to me either email, mail, um, however you want to, Word document, PDF, whatever works for you. Uh, previously, as you can see here, that was called the strategic plan. So you may have heard of it called that and have some previous information and training about that. If you are renewing your accreditation, you may have a previous version of it called that, and that's fine. Um, the, the strategic plan is just a name um, for uh, the, the actual document, but it was confusing to some people. It, um, strategic plans are a certain thing. <laughs> they are um, a lot of organizations or businesses or communities, you know, municipalities have a strategic plan. Like this is our five-year plan for how we're going to run the entire business for the next five years. Uh, and it has a lot of different parts about everything you'll do. That's not exactly what we're asking for in a community needs response plan. So it was getting confusing to people and intimidating and maybe scary to some of you that I have to write a strategic plan for my library. No, this is just a specific, maybe be a, it might be a subset of a strategic plan if you happen to have one already with looking at your community and deciding what needs to be done, what can the library do about it and how you're gonna to respond to some specific things. So uh, we decided um, a couple of years ago that um, we would change uh, what the name of the actual document is. All the content of it is still the same. Everything you need to do to write one is the same. So your previous plan, if you're renewing, can be used as a basis for your new one. 
you don't have to start from scratch or anything, um, but we are calling it the Community Needs Response Plan. And hopefully that make, you know, because it makes more sense and is more accurate, it'll get you more on the right road for what um, you're needing to do. There are three levels of accreditation. Um, you earn points on different things that you do at your library for each level. Uh, bronze, silver, and gold are our three levels. Uh, yes, it was based on the Olympics, <laughs> uh, bronze, silver, and gold medals. Um, at the time this, uh, this new version of accreditation was being put together, it was the Olympics time, and someone did make a little joke saying, hey, what are we going to call our levels now? How about gold, silver, and bronze? Ha ha, isn't that funny? Well, they said, that's a great idea, actually. Let's go with that. So um, our levels are bronze, silver, and gold. Um, previously, um, accreditation was done in a slightly different way and that you had to, there were still three levels of it. In 2013, it, the, the way it worked was changed. Previously, you had to meet all the criteria for level one, and then you were able to start working on level two. You had to meet every criteria in level two before you could become level three. That was really uh, hard for some libraries. There were, you know, if you were just missing one thing, one document, one, one criteria, one, one thing, thing that you couldn't get um, your library do, doing, then um, you would be completely out of luck of jumping from level one to level two just because you're missing one thing. And people thought that was just too um, too hard for libraries to do. So they revamped the system in uh, 2013. And now you can earn, you have some basic points you earn based on what you said in your public, public library survey, the basic survey, what basic info you submitted to us. But then there's other questions that you can answer. And depending on what ones you answer, you earn certain points and working your way up through the three levels. So for example, and then we think this is more equitable among the libraries because one library might be really good at one thing and not so good at something else. And this other library is good at that something else but not the one thing the other library is, but they both earn points and can work their way up. And it really reflects better what each library personally is doing and their level of what um, standards they have and what they need to be providing to their own communities. So it really re reflects better um, hopefully what's going on in each local community out there. Um, okay, so there is, so first you'd have to submit the public library survey and then you get invited to apply. There is an application form online that you can, um, that you submit. That does not go live until July 1st. You'll notice if you do click on it now, it's gonna say it's not gonna begin. And even if you go through here and click all these starting boxes, these are your 12 minimum qualifications that we're gonna go over, it won't even let you get to the next stop, uh, step. It'll still say, nope, it's not July 1st yet. But we do have a preview application on the website. So if you are um, wanting to look ahead of time to see what the questions are, you can go to this preview application and it will show you each of the sections and every question. This isn't a live form. You can't click on anything and make anything happen. Nothing works with it. But you can at least see ahead of time what all the questions are that you're going to be looking at and asking. And there is the help guide that will pop up. It's in here so you can see all of our instructions and extra information that we have put into the form um, if you need it. Um, and you can see how many points each thing is worth. So you can see if, you know, how many you might need to earn to jump up to another level, how many might you're, you know, where you're at, might you might need to earn to get to the basic level. So you can see, whoops, not what I want to do, what, um, yeah, what you'll be working towards. So the 12 minimum qualifications, as you saw on that uh, page there, are um, here. Now these are the basics that we think every library needs to be doing no matter what, um, before you can even start uh, either being accredited or um, re-accrediting, renewing. Uh, so first you need to be legally established under state statute. Uh, chapter 51 of the Nebraska State Statutes is all about libraries and establishing them and what you need to do and how your boards need to be set up and how you work with the city and everything. Uh, then you need to comply with all Nebraska library laws, rules, regulations, um, and any other local or federal laws that, that affect them. Then you also have to have a board, a library board, either a governing or an advisory board, either, time, either type. The board and the director need to be certified. And
and I'll go pop over to our information about certified sort of certification now so we can talk about those while we're at that point in our minimum qualifications. You may have noticed when we do, and I mentioned this earlier, on the little pop-out menu for accreditation also talks about certification. Um, two of your criteria are that your library board is certified and your public library and your library director is certified. These are both um, programs that we run here through the Library Commission. Um, on the board certification, your um, library board must, and this is all about continuing education and lifelong learning and keeping up with what's happening in the field. Specifically for your board, what they need to learn is things having to do with running um, a library board. Uh, collectively as a group, a board needs to earn 20 hours of CE credits during a three-year period. Uh, and this is 20 hours together, not 20 hours for each person. So if you have a board of five people, they just need to each earn in that um, three-year period four credits each. Uh, they can do these at the same time. So if you have a board of five and you sit down and watch a webinar or a training session like this one, for example, if it's an hour long session, then you all, you earn, if they're all sitting there, five of them together watching something, five hours of CE all in one shot. So not too, too difficult to do, but some boards do struggle with the continuing education, the extra education part of what they need to do to be certified and to then be recertified. Re re we do have a list here of some ideas of the kind of things that you can do as a board. Uh, webinars, workshops, in-person sessions, um, online sessions, recordings of online sessions will all be acceptable. We also here at the Library Commission have paid for an account at um, through United for Libraries, which is ALA's organization for uh, friends and foundations and boards, uh, for the Trustee Academy courses. And these are workshops that you can take online. Um, they can each do it alone, um, work on it together, however you want to. And you can see the kind of things these are about are having to do with being a board member. So working on the library's budget, uh, working with your library director, advocacy, the kind of things board members need to be in, interest, um, involved in. Um, and then there are short takes. These are the little short videos that you can watch, little 10 minute videos. Um, if you watch one of those, and then earn and then watch um, some questions that they have, then you can earn CE credit for that as well. So have a little discussion after watching this. So this would be the kind of thing, one of these really quick short things, takes not even like what, half an hour in total, at a board meeting. Put it on the agenda, everybody sits and watch one of these short videos, and then they talk about it, boom, they've all earned um, CE credit for that amount of time. Um, the things that board members can earn continuing education CE credit for on towards their certification is not necessarily going to be the same as what a library director will learn. Uh, some things may cross over, you know, library advocacy policies, of, of course, but if it's a training session, for example, about how to run a story time for toddlers, like how to actually do that as a staff person, that would not be something a board direct, a library board member would earn CE credit that doesn't have to do with doing their job as a board member. The person who works the library, library director or staff person, they would be able to earn CE credit for that kind of training. Um, if a board member wants to attend it, that's fine. They can, you know, that's great that they're learning, but it's not something about doing their job as a board member, so they that makes it not eligible for them to earn the CE for it. Um, and we have lots of other links to other things that you can attend, other short videos. So there's a lot of things out there that you can access and send to your boards um, to help them um, earn their CE. For things that you attend that we host here um, via the Library Commission or that you attend through our regional library systems and you have a checkoff sheet or something, we will um, gather that information and submit your continuing education credits for you. Um, for example, today, all of you who are logged in, I'm going to get a spreadsheet afterwards from GoToWebinar that will tell you me you are all here, and I will be able to submit that to Linda Babcock, who keeps track of that for us, and so you can all earn your CE. Uh, so I'll actually, I should say right now while we're I'm talking about it, if there's more than one person sitting with you at a computer and you're all watching around one, you've only logged in as one person, let me know in the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface who else is with you so we can make sure they get their CE credit as well. I know someone did uh, contact me earlier and was telling me someone else would be with them. Um, but if anybody else has that same situation, you're watching as a group or 
um, a bunch of people, uh, more than one person together. The only way I'll know there's somebody besides the person who logged in is if you type into the questions section there and let me know. Now, if you attend something else or you just want to make sure we get your credit, there is a form here for public library boards to report to us. There's a separate form for library directors or staff to report their CE um, activity. So here's for the board member. Um, and you can see here uh, in one form, you can do multiple activities and list multiple names of people attending. So you don't have to do, for example, like I said before, if you've got five board members sitting and watching a webinar, you don't have to submit five different forms. You submit this one form, list the activity, list the names of all the people that were there, and then they could all get submitted with one um, form for that particular event. You can also look up your board's status. Um, there's a link here for it. Also on the pop-out menu, you'll see there's the library board status review. So you can, if you're not sure and you wanna know where your board is at, are you certified, are they not, how many hours do they need, you can look it up here. Um, you can see here we have the libraries, it's arranged by city by default, but you can, um, um, sort it by library name, system expiration date, and you'll see if a board is certified, when they expire, what regional system you're in. Um, if a board has expired, you'll see their year is in red, um, which means they need to you know, work on getting recertified if they want to. Um, and if you click on the library's name, you will get their board certificate, the board records. So you can see exactly for the current three-year period, what we have in our, in our records as what they've attended and for how many hours and what it all was. You can see how many hours they currently have and how many are needed and when they need to be recertified by. So they need, so this is uh, Ainsworth needs to do another nine and a half CE by um, September 30th of 2021. So they've got plenty of time. <laughs> um, we also list who the board members are as far as we know in our database. If you need to update that, there's an information link here where you can let us know if any of this information is, is, is wrong needs to be changed. <clears throat> uh, the three-year period for the board certification, you'll notice this is three years, uh, library accreditation is three years, public librarian, the library director certification is also three years. The expiration dates of those will not necessarily match up. They're not all going to be on the same um, timeline uh, because you may have started each one of these things at different times. Uh, library accreditation now goes for a full year and it expires at the end of the year in December and then um, you go three years and then it renews again. For your board certification and your librarian certification, it starts whenever you first joined the program, before you first started doing it. So you can see here, um, apparently Ainsworth did it starting as of the end of September. So that's when their recertification is due. If they were up for accreditation right now, uh, they don't need to have all of their CE done by the accreditation time. They're now in the process of um, keeping up with their board certification. They are currently certified still because your current certification lasts for three years. So this is good through 2021. Um, so they're certified. And when 2021 comes along, they got to make sure they get all their point, their CE by that to, re to renew. Uh, same thing with the public librarian certification. Uh, it might not match up. Your director might have be in the middle of working on their certification and they've got 10 other credits done and they need to do however many more. As long as they're still certified from last time, they're good as far as the criteria for the library being accredited is concerned. Now, if you're unsure about if this information is correct or you think you submitted something um, and we don't have it listed on here, Linda Babcock here at the Library Commission is who you would um, submit a contact. Um, or if you don't see something listed here, you just click on the button. It brings you back to that board uh, report uh, form to submit something. It's okay to resubmit if you're not sure You know something is here. She'll sort through it and figure out and just give you the right credits for everything. Uh, so also under the board, we do have a library board manual that we've created. This is something you may used to have had years ago as a big fat binder. It's all online now. The basics of being a board member. So this is something also that can help your board members um, just keep up on what they need to do um, in their jobs. All right, so the other thing is your library director also needs to be certified. So this is the board as a whole. Now the librarian certification, this is about individual library staff. 
um, anyone who's a librarian here in the state and works or works at a library in the state can um, apply to the certification program to earn their certification if they want to. There's a special form to submit to let us know you're starting the process. Uh, oh, there was the same thing back on the board one. I didn't mention that. There's a form you have to let us know that your board is working towards certification. You can't just start attending things and assume you're going to start earning CE. There's actually a form that you do have to uh, application form there is right there to actually say yes we want to start um, becoming certified and then there's the same thing for the librarian so any staff who you have working in the library can do this in order to be accredited for the whole library your director has to be certified there are different levels of certification. The levels are based on, once again, the size of the population you serve, and then there's some basic requirements of that. Uh, everybody has to have a high school diploma or a GED equivalent, something equivalent, and then depending on how large your community is, you need to have more education, either um, at a college or university, going to uh, library school, having a degree, a master's degree there, or working towards courses, associates, bachelors, whatever. Um, if you don't have that, then you can do our basic skills courses that we offer here at the Library Commission to earn that education. Uh, we know that not everybody um, is going to go to college or can have the time to do that um, or the money, and we do have these free courses we offer, the basic skills classes that you must complete depending on the level you're going for, uh, and that will help you get the knowledge and education you need to uh, work at and run your library. Now, staff people need to earn um, 45 credits, CE credits, a lot more than a board member, of course, because this is about running the library. So oh, also over a three-year period, though, so you have three years to earn 45 credits, so that's 15 credits a year, not bad. Um, you should be able to, you know, do that. And same kind of thing, you can um, earn credits for attending workshops, attending conferences, webinars. For example, everyone who is actually attending this workshop today, we should go for about two hours if everything goes on time. <laughs> All of you will earn board members and library staff, library directors, two hours of CE credit each. Um, so this counts. If you aren't watching this live, you're watching this as a recording, you'll get the same two hours. <laughs> um, you would have to submit to us to let us know you attend and you watch the recording. Um, if you attend um, our Nebraska Library Association School Librarians Association annual conference or any of our spring meetings or any of those kind of in-person things, let us know and you can earn CE for that. Uh, webinars online, recordings of webinars, actually taking academic courses for college credit. You can get credit for that as well. Um, something else that I think some people don't realize or, or, or um, and I didn't know, if you actually teach yourself, if you are presenting webinars or presenting sessions, so if you are attending a conference and you are presenting an hour long or a 50 minute session on a topic, that counts as continuing education as well. And you can submit for that and get CE because you taught other people about something. Um, I sometimes have people come on my weekly Encompass Live online show if you're one of my speakers, I will um, let Holly and Linda know, and then you'll earn the CE for attending, for being the presenter for that day, for that session. Uh, there is a reporting form also for the library staff, a different one than the board one. So board has its own form, librarian staff has its, uh, what kind of event it is, when it was, and then you submit this, it goes to Linda, and she will then add it to your record. If there's any questions about it, this also in the, um, board one, she may come back to you and want more clarification or something sometimes. Uh, there is a record lookup, also a CE record lookup for the library staff. Um, I won't be able to show you this one because it does have a password, but you just put in your first name, last name, password. There is a lookup here if you need to look up what your password is, and it will tell you basically the same information that you saw on the board record of how many hours you have, what we have you down for, and how many hours you still need to do. So if you're wondering where you're at in the process, do you have enough credits, do you, how many more do you need, go here and you will be able to look that up yourself. It's also, of course, in the pull-out menu here, um, there you go, CE record review under librarian certification. For staff or directors, we actually have also similar, comparable to the library board manual, we have a director's guidebook. 
So this is specifically for library directors, although some of your staff can benefit from certain sections depending on what they do at your library. And uh, this is all about, I see it's much longer than the uh, board one, everything you might need to know about being a library director. So I definitely recommend taking a look at this and using it to do um, your job, whether you're a new director or uh, you've been around for a while, you might learn something from there. Uh, let's see, we do have a question that has come in here. Do we need to fill out and submit them on the agency? Uh, okay, the question is, do we need to fill out and submit the form saying we did see hours for things like this, meaning the workshop we're doing right now, or is it automatically applied? Yes, um, no, you don't, you, sh you don't need to submit for anything that you attend live that we present like this. And usually we'll try and mention that sometime during the, the workshops or um, even in-person things we do, um, hopefully <laughs> to let you know. Um, the last couple of weeks I've been going around the state doing this same workshop in person um, with uh, checkoff sheets that people um, check off their name and say, yes, I was here. Uh, this kind of thing I take and then I submit and give to Linda and she gets your CE automatically. So for that, you don't need to do it yourself. I'll submit it to her. Um, usually for anything that you attend that our regional library systems are hosting, uh, they will submit on your behalf as well because they'll have a similar checkoff sheet that, yep, you're here. Uh, but if you do anything where you're not like with us that we know you're here, you would have to do it yourself. So like if you watch a recording of this, you'd need to submit that one. I can't tell who's been watching our recordings. There's nothing that gathers that information. Or if you attend something that's not something we are running, you would then definitely need to send that in to us. All right, so that's your board certification and librarian certification are both needed before as criteria for become your library becoming accredited. So, any other questions about that? Feel free to type in anything you have. I answered your question there, Wendy. Amy, I see what you typed about who you got sitting with you today. We'll make sure everybody gets their credits. All right, uh, next um, main criteria is you receive local funding from your village, township, county, whoever is your local municipality. Can't be just uh, donations and you know, uh, f or you know, a library with no funds. Uh, you submitted the most recent public library survey. Actually, parts of the, some of the survey questions and the supplemental survey, uh, some of those questions are automatically pre-fed into the this application form that we're going into so that you can, um, you don't have to re-answer some all these questions. If we've already asked you something in the public library survey, it'll pre-populate and you already have those answers in there for you. Uh, you do have to have paid library staff working at your library. Uh, this is, you can't be just a volunteer run library with nobody who's paid for the job. Now, if you do need to have volunteers come in sometimes to cover for you for certain things, like you all, you know, your staff goes to a meeting or an event or a conference, and, but you still want to keep the library open at home and a volunteer comes in um, or a board member to run the library, that's fine. Um, it's you know, on a you know, case by case basis every now and then, but not as your regular daily um, running of the library. It has to be paid staff. Director has an email address that they actually use and check regularly. Uh, now that may sound a little weird to have to say, but when this uh, accreditation process was first started a long time ago, uh, some people did not have email addresses. Even though many of us were using it, uh, we did have some library directors who refused to have an email address, said, I don't even check my email. If you want to contact me, call me on the phone or send me something in the regular snail mail. They decided back then, no, you need to have an email address. That's how we're going to reach out to you. We have 60 to 70 libraries every year that are up for reaccreditation. We can't be calling and <laughs> mailing things out. So made that a requirement. I'm hoping now at some point I might be able to take that off as a requirement and it won't be 12 minimum. It should be 11. It'll be a standard, but we'll see. Uh, making your basic services available without charging people who are in your service area that pay the taxes to your library. Uh, so this is your basic, you know, borrowing books, using the materials um, the, in the library. Um, getting research reference help from the staff people. Now, if you do have like paid cards, you know, if you have a people that come outside your area and you have them pay for a library card and out of out of area card, that's fine. They aren't supporting your taxes. Um, little thing, other things beyond these, what's listed here, like paying for paper when you use the printer, paying for materials. 
that are used for craft events or makerspace events, um, equipment and whatnot, that is perfectly fine. This is just talking about your basic book, book, book loaning, using, talking to the librarian, using the reference, using the materials in-house. Also, you need to access the internet at no charge. You cannot charge a per minute fee or something to someone to use um, your internet. And then you do an annual report to whoever your governing body or local government is um, and to the public. So some sort of an annual report about what the library is doing that you do. Now, once you get all those 12 basic general criteria, you will then see what pops up at the bottom is the apply for accreditation button. Now, if I, I'm in here, I logged into like a special link so I can get into the form. Um, if you try to do it now before July 1st, you'll get a message that will say, no, it's too early, you can't do it until July 1st. But after July 1st, when I email you, it will say, hey, accreditation's open, go ahead, go to your form. Uh, you have an ID and password. This is the same user ID and password that you use to submit your public library survey. So that bibliostat username and password. So we don't make you learn a new one. There is a little look up here too, if you can't remember what that is since you did your survey last fall or whenever it was. So I have one here I've already logged into because I'm not going to show you someone's username and password. Uh, Norfolk Public Library has graciously agreed to let us borrow their form to look at it online and see um, how this all works. So this is actually their live form now that I'm into um, just for this demo purposes. So when you first go into the actual form, you've got some basic instructions here about how it's gonna work. Uh, you'll see that there is, uh, certain things will be automatically pre-filled in your form, as I mentioned, coming from the public library survey. Green check means you meet the guideline, red X means you don't. Um, this is also quite, a lot of these questions are just based on what you've submitted as your answers, but some of them are actually peer question, review questions. You're being compared to your peer libraries. Um, your peer libraries are libraries that are similar in local service area to your library. So you can see who they are when you're in your form there. So we just look and see what the size of your community is and find other ones similar and that's who we compare you to. Usually we try to have four or five above and below. Um, you can see here for Norfolk, um, we have it a little off, but we also have some Iowa libraries. Not every community in Nebraska has enough communities of the same size to compare to. <clears throat> Excuse me. So in order to be able to have something, a, a valid calculation done, a valid you know, comparison done, we actually look at Iowa's public library statistics and use their information to do some of the peer comparisons. So they'll be similar size as your community that we'll be comparing to. Um, all this public library survey data is out there um, publicly. We post ours, they post theirs, so we can use it for this purpose. Uh, as I said, Sam Shaw is in charge of all the peers library data. So if you have questions about that, you can talk to him. Um, as I said, the point, you accumulate points for each level and you'll see here, this little box that's popping down and following along with us as we're going through the form. As you're checking and unchecking questions, you'll see that it will change. If I uncheck this one here, this policy here, it goes down to 218. Recheck, it goes back to 219. If I check another one up to 220. So, you will have a running tab here of what your points are so you can see where you're at in the process. There are also help guides throughout the form. I showed it to you before, so you can click on that. Pop-up will come up. It will dump you to that specific question, questions help information, but this is the full help, so you can scroll up and down inside there and see information about any other questions on the form. So we're gonna quickly go through each of the sections of the form here so we can talk about some of the different things um, that are that you're being asked. Now the first thing here is a green check. It's already um, automatically checked for you. You can't undo that. That's because we clicked on those 12 minimum, minimum qualifications to even get into the form. And then you need to have your community needs response plan. Um, this is your plan about how you're looking at your community and we're going to talk about that um, after we go through this form. This needs to be submitted to me. It used to say on this form it needed to be approved. That was confusing and wrong. Um, what I usually, what I do when you are applying for accreditation is I take what you've submitted here in your form and I take what you've written in your plan and I look at them together. 
to make sure that anything you've mentioned in your plan, you've checked off that corresponding question if there is something in here that relates to it. Um, and if you've checked off something in your plan, you've mentioned, or in your form, you've mentioned it in your plan, making sure everything matches up and you're getting the right points that you should be getting. So I need both of those just to me. I don't approve either the plan or your accreditation until I finish looking at them both together. Um, after I'm, I've done that, I may reach out to you with questions while I'm doing it. If I need to know more information, if something's confusing, if I'm not finding something you said you did on your website or something, I'll reach out to you. Um, but then when they're both all evaluated, then you'll get your approval of both of them. If you uncheck this box, you will get an error. <laughs> you do have to have submitted the plan to me in order to to get through your application here. So, um, and you'll see it just has a little thing there that says uh, you must have a written plan. Uh, you have to check it before proceeding. If you don't have a plan, go to our library page for more information or talk to me about it. So that box has to be checked in order to uh, submit your form here. Uh, you review the plan annually. Plans are something that you should be using on a regular basis just to keep up with what you're doing. So um, you, if you want to earn those points, check that box. Tell you the last time. Tell me the last time you looked at it. And then there's a list of policies. There's lots of different policies that libraries um, can have. We list some examples of some things that we know you might have. Check all the ones you do. If we also you have three extra ones here. If there's something you have a policy for that we just didn't come up with as, a, as an example, type it in there and you can get points for that as well. Um, you do not have to have a separate written policy for like each one of these things is a separate document. If they're all part of one big policy about something, that's fine. Um, if they're in some other document, it's, that's something else that you have, that's fine. Just as long as you have something that if any of these things you have to deal with, like patron behavior, does somebody want to put exhibits up, uh, what's uh, customer complaints that come to the library, any of these kind of things, how people can use your meeting rooms, as long as you have something written down somewhere, some written procedures and policies of how you do this, that you can check off the boxes there. A separate kind of plan is a technology plan. This would be about what is the technology you have in your library and how are you going to keep it up to date. Uh, basically, you know, we have this many computers, these are our routers, this is our system, um, these are our servers and our network, and we know in three years we're going to update the computers, and then in another four years we're going to get new routers. And you've got this all planned out for you. Um, we do have uh, help about that if you want to see about doing one of those, um, about um, how to write tech plans, what kind of things could be included in them. Um, this used to be a requirement for E-Rate. If you do E-Rate, that's why it's on our E-Rate page. It's no longer a requirement, but we still have all the information up there to help you write one. So these are really good plans to have just to keep track of what, we're ha what we have in the library, an inventory of that, how old it is, and when it might need to be updated so that you can just keep things you know, current and useful. Um, the next two questions here, having a friends group or a foundation. These come from your survey questions. As it says here, it tells you, based on the information submitted for the supplemental survey. Uh, there is the basic public library survey that we have you do, and then there's an additional supplemental survey with extra questions that we in Nebraska, we wanted to know that are on the main survey. And that's where these questions come through. So you can see Norfolk, they don't have a friends group, but they do have a foundation. And these are just automatically filled in because we pre-filled from the survey and they can't uncheck these or change them or anything. Now, for any of these things that do come from your survey, whether it's the main one or the supplemental, if something has changed since you submitted the survey, between when you submitted the survey and when you're doing this form, we can behind the scenes change that for this application form. Uh, I have had that happen many times that you know, the survey was uh, submitted last December, but now in um, July of the next year, we've actually come, we've created a friends group now. We actually do have one. We didn't have one last December, but now one's been um, set up. You let us know, Sam and our IT people, we can go behind the scenes and we can change that to make it a green check for you so you can get those points. We do know that situations do change between submitting the survey and submitting your accreditation application form. Um, when you submit the this form, I want it to be ac correct and accurate to what's happening when you're submitting this form, not when you did that survey six months ago or whatever. So if anything is different, just let us know and we'll update that for you. 
Uh, second part of this is your resources, uh, your income. And this is where we get into the peer comparisons. So this is comparing your library's income to uh, the set li uh, communities the same size as yours. So as long as you meet either the average of all those communities or the median, you earn the credit for that. You don't have to have both, both the average and the median. You may meet one or the other um, and you'll get the green checks. You can see here you've got your local income, how, what hours are you open, um, the schedule of hours reflecting an attempt to meet the needs of the community and then asking, you letting us know when was the last time you asked your community when they think the library should be open. Now this does not mean checking this box does not mean you actually change the hours based on when they wanted you open. They may have some uh, out of that, uh, those you know, crazy ideas about when they want the library open and you might not be able to meet them and that's okay. As long as you've asked them, what do you guys think about when the library should be open, then you can earn these points for this. And then of course, meeting all federal, state and local codes for your basic safety and access to the building. Uh, now your staff, um, expenditures um, on your staff. So this would be salary and uh, benefits. How do you compare to your peers? And then here's where we have the information about your library director and then any library staff that may be certified, gone through that certification program that we have. Your director, as you can see here, this is how the minimum certification level is based on the local service area population of what, your library. So. Um, You'd have to see whichever, you can see here for uh, Norfolk, they're um, required is five, and they are five, they're 10,000 or more, they want to be bigger, of course. Um, so as long as the director is um, certified, that automatically fills in because we have that information from your public library survey. Any additional staff that are certified, you can also earn more points for. So here you can see they have certified staff, an extra six of them, um, that are also have gone through our program beyond the library director and then you can earn extra points for any of those. Um, how many F FTE you have compared to your peers and then does your library have um, um, resources funding specifically for continuing education? This long paragraph here means is there a line item somewhere in your budget? Is there specific money in your budget that you use to pay for attending state conferences, pay travel to traveling to workshops, um, pay for certification programs or um, uh, registration fee for something? Does the library have a funding um, specifically designated for that? Um, and you can see this also just comes right from that survey. Now on to the technology that you have in the library. Do you have an online created library system? Um, is it available online? Um, how's your broadband internet? Is it adequate to meet the growing user needs? Hmm, that's up to you to decide. <laughs> Do you have a phone with an answering machine or voicemail? Um, technology accommodations for persons with disabilities. This would be specifically things like um, special software, screen reader software, that will um, help people with disabilities um, know what's on the screen. Uh, special computers uh, that have special keyboards or equipment for um, people with disabilities. And an adequate number of computers is determined by either, if you've mentioned this in your community needs response plan or your technology plan. Technology plan is where you would keep, you would you know, have a plan for, this is the size of our community, this is how many computers we should have, do we have enough? You can see here, Norfolk doesn't think they have an adequate number. And that's actually pretty common. Uh, there's so many people wanting to use our computers. They're always waiting in line. There's always a line for it. So we do not have an adequate number because there's just too many people um, always waiting. So they honestly did not check that box. So then we have uh, questions about your library's collection. Does it reflect your mission and goals of the library? Hopefully. Um, how do you do on weeding the collection? Uh, do you use your staff use online websites? So this would be things like going to Google and looking up things on there, going to the American Cancer Society website to find um, data and research resources. So your library staff being able to help your library users do this. Uh, and then we've got some questions here, all peer comparisons to other libraries about how your expenditures on your um, materials are. Uh, annual circulation of them, turnover rate in the circulation collection, uh, collection, and collection size. So all of these just pulled from your survey and compared to your peers. Uh, okay, we have a question that just came up here. I just see that there. Uh, is the end of life for Windows 7 going to be an issue? 
We couldn't upgrade this year due to a budget cut. Money is going to be an issue for this next year too. Um, we don't have any requirements on what level you need to have your equipment on, what, what, like you need to have Windows 7 or whatever um, beyond. Um, I think if you just try and keep up with what you can, that's that's fine. You know, everybody's going to be able to do it at a different rate. We've we've had many libraries in the past who have been beyond what we have here. Here at the state, sometimes we haven't had the most up to date. <laughs> I can say. Also, it's sometimes money issues, uh, staff and time issues for all the computers we have here. So um, we don't have any. There's nothing in any of our information about technology or even about technology plan that tells you you must be at whatever level. The plan is just at least have a plan to know what you're going to do and that you do, and just so we know you're being aware, are aware of the fact that you need to keep things up to date as well as you can. Um, everything we do should work. We try to. We do know that we have lots of libraries that are not able to, you know, upgrade as quickly, um, and we do try to keep anything we do that's online related um, at a level that anyone who we might be working with will still be able to access. So that shouldn't be a problem. Uh, I hope that helps answer your question. Do the best you can. That's all you can do. <laughs> awesome. All right. Yeah. Okay. So the services that we offer, that you offer at your library. So this is the actual programming things that you're doing. Do you do outreach programs going out into the community? So uh, delivering books to people, homebound people, doing a story time in the local daycare, something outside the library's building building. Um, doing interlibrary loan, do you do that yourself or do you use the library commission? We do provide ILL services through here where we, if you are not able to find out and um, borrow those books yourselves, you just come through us. We have information on our website about that and we can borrow books for you from any library in the country. Um, attendance at your programs, how does that compare to your peers? Um, Oh, here we go. Library programs um, that are have been mentioned in your community needs response plan. When you do your plan, and we'll see that when we get into that in a second here, um, in a little bit here, you're going to come up with certain programs and ideas and things you might want to do. So are you actually doing some of those programs? You can list those here. And then uh, another, some more questions here that come from your survey answers. Are you using the LICE databases that we have through the Library Commission? And you can see here we have some help guides to tell you what we're talking about here. Uh, Nebraska Access, that's the databases that we offer for free. Um, the legislature gives us funding to provide this to all, library, all citizens in the state. So are you using that through um, to provide resources to your patrons? And then do you act, um, have things that you subscribe to that are um, in addition to what we do? So other databases, other systems that you have. And you can see here, Norfolk has a pretty long list of all the different things they do. So, um, and this is all just pulled from your survey. So you've already answered these questions. Uh, so is there anything else that you pay for in addition to the ones you get for free through us? And then do you have Wi-Fi in your library? Uh, next question here is about uh, collaboration and uh, cooperating with other um, groups. Does the library director or any library staff um, or member of the board attend at least two village, city council, township board meetings? Basically, your municipality, are you having a face on there at those meetings? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean you're on the agenda and you're speaking, but you're at least attending and keeping up with what they're doing. Um, at least do it twice a year, uh, and it can be either you, if either your library director can do that, or board members can fill in for that. Um, staff participating in community organizations and groups um, to so keep the library involved in other organizations out there. And you can see here we have um, this would be things like Rotary Club, Kiwanis, those kind of things. Um, other groups, you know, so anything that you can you can join with and partner with on um, programs. Do you have a team board? This is something many libraries are doing. Uh, we know that uh, and when uh, children are young, they're big library users, their parents bring them in. When uh, people become adults, they use the library as well pretty, well, pretty much, um, even our millennials. But teens kind of lose. Sometimes some of us lose the teens. So many libraries are having a teen advisory board to help them um, bring in more teens or to run the programs um, and keep the youth coming into the library. 
Um, do you cooperate with other entities for shared services? And you can see here, where did that question go? Um, we're talking about things like uh, other departments of the um, of your town, like Parks and Rec. So do you work with the Parks and Rec department to do a story time in a local park or something? Something that is a group thing that you're both, you're actually providing a service and you're both promoting it together. Uh, advocacy efforts. Are you um, board members and staff participating in any sort of advocacy? Now this would be attending, of course, the Nebraska Library Association does advocacy day here in the spring um, at the Capitol uh, if you attend those. But there's also things that ALA does, online workshops and sessions and things. So if anybody who participates in anything that has to do with advocacy, uh, you can earn points for each of those people that you list there. Um, and then are you participating in any of our resource sharing things like our Overdrive, Nebraska Car, the Pioneer Consortium, are you a part of any of that? And the last question, section of your application form here is about communications. How are you sharing the information and the resources and what your library offers to your community? Um, on your library's website, do you post your mission statement and those policies? Now this section here, um, many of these questions you'll probably realize I can't um, really uh, check to see if you're doing necessarily all of these things, but at this point here, for some things that I can check, I will. So if you say you post your mission statement and policies on your website, I will go and find your library's website and look for it online and see if they're there. Um, if you do any of these social media things, I will go look and see what you're doing there. Um, Oh, a question we have here that just came in though, uh, points specifically for maker spaces. Um, as far as a service that you offer, um, if it's something you mentioned in your plan, you could get points for that. Um, we don't have any specific question about makerspaces yet. It's not a thing that everybody is, is doing, um, but it is, um, you know, oh, sometimes it's technology related. So which question were you wondering about? Where do you think that might fit into, I guess is what I would want to know about points specifically for makerspaces. Is that part of your collection, technology? Oh, that's not me. Is that something we have a specific question about now? No, but if it is something that you think, oh, on services. Well, if you're, doing the, if you're doing those kind of group collaboration things, yes, if you're doing a makerspace and it's in collaboration with someone else, definitely. So if you're going outreach and taking, I know some libraries, yes, are taking their button maker or the things that are more portable out into the community. Um, definitely, that would count. Um, whatever the program is or service that you're offering, if you have either you bring it out or if, for example, if you mention something in your plan, like you said, we want to have a program where we bring bring the kids in to show them and have a program for using the um, 3D printer or something, you know, that would totally count, yes. I think that might be why we're so vague with our definition, we just say programs and services, whatever it is that you've come up with, whether it's related to the traditional delivering of books, doing a story time, doing a craft time, makerspace would count as well, yep. So on to communication, back to communication. So as I said, this is something that I will um, look for. So the next section, session question here is about using all your social media. Do you um, post things to a blog or your website, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Snapchat, whatever the news, the next thing that someone's going to come up with that you use, and you interact with your public out there. Uh, you know, it does say at least monthly. I know for some people that may be a little rough. What I usually do is I look for the most recent year and see if at least you're published posting something every other month or so, a couple of times a year, depending on you know what's going on in your library. Uh, I just make sure you're using these things. So when you list here what you have, I will go and look for those and make sure you are actually posting on there. Um, but then you still do need to um, promote things not on the internet. There are people that don't use social media, that don't use Facebook, that don't want to. And there's, these are still tons of people you can get in touch with about what you're doing with the good old fashioned newsletters, newspapers, posting flyers, uh, radio um, ads, or you know having a spot on the radio. Um, 
some people put things into their you know utility bills anything that gets out to everybody so any of the non-internet related things if you're doing any of this you get points for that you can check that box do you have exhibits and displays in your library? Either a display of here's the books for summer reading program or here's someone who has a teacup collection and we're gonna display it for the next month. Uh, that would count for that. Um, letting the public use a bulletin board to promote their things. So having something for public use, this, is, this, this would not be just doing your um, paper promotion, this would be letting the public use it. And then reporting, um, to the village board, city council, whoever um, is your local municipality. It does say here usually monthly. This will depend on whenever you're scheduled to report to them, as long as you do do it. Um, posting those reports on your website. And then actually, then the last thing here is communicating with other organizations. It's kind of co very common for a library to report back to their village or city or town. but. Other organizations, civic organizations, if there's a business or an economic group, a business leader group in your chamber of commerce or something in your community, do you go there to communicate with them? Either communicate, just emailing them or keeping in touch with them to promote things. Do you attend their meetings uh, if they have open board meetings and whatnot? So keeping up with what, um, not the usual uh, groups that you would uh, submit to. Um, and then it will fill in the library director's name based off of your survey. Uh, you see your points have been totaled up on the side. There's a box at the bottom. At this point, you can submit or save your um, application. If at any time during the application, you do not have to do this whole huge thing all in one sitting. If you only know some of the answers or you only get partway through it, that's fine. You just save. Um, you can save this and you can come back to it when you log in again later. It'll have saved all the answers you've you already um, put in there and let you continue and pick up where you left off. When you're totally done, you think you've answered all the questions, then you submit. Um, you can still get it back into it after you've submitted. It's not like it's locked or it's in stone. Um, but generally the idea is once you hit that submit, I get a special notification letting me know that you've submitted and I know you're done with the application. I'll then go look and see, did you get these um, your plan to me yet so that I can start comparing them and working on all of my evaluation. Does not have to be at the same time, that's okay. Um, however you can get each one to me. As I said, a lot of things that you might check off on here and mention in your plan are going to relate to each other, so you should be working on both of these together so that you have everything mentioned in your plan. The document that you submit to me is also checked off correctly on here. And as it, there is also, you can't even submit this until you check this box that says you have submitted your plan to me. I am... Um, I do waffle on that. As long as you're working on it and you just want to get this done, that's okay to check that box. Uh, however, if you never get your plan to me, you're not going to get accredited, and so the whole checking of this box will be moot. <laughs> um, but it is okay if you're still in the process, but you think you're done with this. If you want to do that, I recommend, like I said, try and do them both at the same time together and submit them both at the same time so that you just have everything matching and correct and up to date. So that's your application form. Any other questions about the form itself? Let me get back to my accreditation page here. As people have been asking questions throughout, that's great. Just type in a question whenever you think of something, whenever you want to ask me about something on here. So your accreditation, you did your survey, you have met your requirements, gone through that form and looked at all the questions that need to be done. And then the other last thing you need to do is work on that community needs response plan. Now we have a whole separate page about the community's response plan that we will go and look at. And this is where you can start the um, packet of information that I sent to you and posted onto the session page. You can follow along some of these um, pages in here. It will be what I'm talking about. Everything that's in that packet is also on this planning, um, almost everything. It's on the planning page here. Um, so there was that article that I talked to you about that I had emailed to you last minute, sorry, about Hartford Public Library. They had a um, issue going on in their community, this is Hartford, Connecticut, where there was a difficulty between the police and the teens and some of the people in town. So the library hosted a meeting for these groups to talk. 
um, had nothing to do with library programming, had nothing to do with services they were offering at the library. They just were the neutral ground, a place where um, these two groups could meet and connect. And it really did, it did a great thing. People felt comfortable there. Um, in our in-person workshops for this, people usually I have people read this and then tell me you know, what you think about it. Um, I'm not going to make us sit here for five minutes and quiet <laughs> while we're doing this, but um, the kind of things, this is the kind of thing that, that we're thinking, the kind of mindset we want you to try and be in when you're thinking about, when you're doing your community needs response plan. What is something happening in your community that the library can help with? You're not going to solve everything. You know, the library isn't solving the problems between the police force and the teens and the people in town, but they were able to be the place where they could facilitate the discussion. Um, like I said, the neutral ground. Sometimes if the mayor's office or the village board was going to host a meeting, people may not necessarily be as open to that and feel as comfortable because they may think they have certain uh, ulterior motives or something. People seem to think the library is a nice, is a good, safe place where they can talk about whatever. And this worked out great for them in um, Hartford. So um, read that article when you get a chance, if you haven't already, and it will give you the, the kind of vibe, the kind of idea of what we're talking about with community needs response planning. Um, this is not generally the kind of thing you are taught or learn when you go to library school or even take our basic skills classes. So we're talking in those courses, it's a lot of really uh, concrete day-to-day, -day, here's what you do in your job. But this non-traditional thinking, something that the community needs, and this is what we're trying to get you to think about with your accreditation process and this community needs response plan. Uh, when it was previously called the strategic plan, that was the idea then too was you're thinking strategically about what's going on in your community and what can you do to, to get involved in that or to work with that. Uh, as I said, that, that word kind of confused people <laughs> a bit, but um, that is what you were thinking, what we wanted you to do is look outside your library walls, find something that you can that you can help with. Uh, like I said, you're not going to solve everything and that is perfectly fine. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't try and, and, and there's going to be many, many things going on in your community the library can do nothing about. And that's fine too. You're going to look at everything going on and then pick the ones that you think might be something that you can um, work with. <clears throat> now, there are seven basic elements that need to be in your community needs response plan. As long as you have all of these in some way, shape, or form in there, you will be, it'll be approved by me. Um, and we have specific uh, worksheets and help guides that can help you get all of these parts in there. Now, if you are being, or you are up for reaccreditation, which means you've done this before, you will have a previous plan um, that you can work from. As I said earlier, you do not have to rewrite something from scratch again. So if you are becoming, are you doing reaccreditation this year or next, take your previous plan and just change the things that need to be changed. You don't have to start all over again. There'll be certain things in here that are going to be the same, like your library's mission statement, most likely. Um, unless something major has changed in how you're providing services or what services you might be providing, that will probably be the same thing. Uh, your community profile. This will definitely be different. This is census data, um, the demographics of your community. Um, what makes your community unique? What are the, the, the different um, um, populations? What's happening with housing? What's happening with education in your town? That's definitely going to be something you update um, based on census data. I'm going to show you how to get that. And then an assessment of your community's needs. Uh, looking at what's happening, doing a uh, survey, doing a focus group. Uh, does, did your community do a quality of life survey already for the community? Um, and this is something about what the community needs, not the library. This is where you got to start thinking, and it gets difficult for some people. Stop thinking about what the library is doing, what the library can do, what the library or library users need. Just look outside your walls and what's going on in the community. Um, and as I said, not necessarily going to be things your library can even respond to. You're going to get a whole list of things that are happening in town. Um, the roads are horrible. The dog park needs maintenance. Uh, the internet service is, is bad. All these things the library not necessarily can have everything to do with. But there will be some things that will pop up that you might make a connection with. 
Um, and then you're going to do an analysis, uh, SWOT, if you've heard of that before. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is something that is um, people have had struggled with in our uh, our plans that we've asked them to do. And this is because we've had we've made this different. Usually when you do this kind of analysis, you're looking at your entire organization. A business looks at their strengths and weaknesses and then the opportunities and threats to their business or to the organization. What we've done for our purposes is we split it up into what are the library's strengths and weaknesses and then outside of the library, what are the opportunities and threats in the community? So when you're looking and reporting and putting in your plan about opportunities and threats, the word library should never be mentioned in there. This is just about what's happening elsewhere. The first two parts, you'll talk all about the library's good things and bad things, and then you look at the good things and bad things in the community. And then with all this information that you have, you've done a profile, found your census data and demographics, you've asked what the community needs are, you've analyzed your strengths, weaknesses, and then your community's opportunities and threats. Then you analyze all of this to come up with some specific and goals, things that you can actually do. Uh, a new program you're gonna institute, a meeting you're gonna host, um, whatever. Um, and you're gonna be looking at all this information to come up with those things. Now, this is not, and this is one reason why I changed the name from strategic plan to just community needs response planning. This is not going to be every single goal, every single thing your library is going to do um, over the next three years. It's going to be, we've looked at all a bunch of things going on in our community, and we've come up with three different things we want to do. And that's it. That's all I need is three different goals, projects, things that you might do. Um, that have come out of this research that you did about your community and about what your library has been doing. Um, so this is just like a small subset, just getting, um, I think part of the reasoning behind this was some of our libraries have become very um, closed off and blinders on and we do our library things and that's all we're doing and that's good. Uh, but we want to look outside of that, help your community be part of it, be out there in their face, make sure they know that you're the library and you're doing these great things for all of them so they can be very supportive of you. Um, this is all advocacy for the library too. So you only need to come up with three things that you might do based on all this information you've gathered. Um, and then a plan for evaluating this. This is going to be this is going to be a document that you will use regularly. It is not something that you should write now and then come back to it in three years to look at it again when you're up for reaccreditation. Because these goals and projects you're going to come up with is going to be something you're going to do between now and the next time you're up. So you're going to definitely want to look at it regularly. <clears throat> So to help you out with this, we have a 12-step program <laughs> uh, with just the basic steps you can take. And we're going to go through this specifically, but this is just the document. This is um, If you have a better way of writing this document up and getting those seven basic criteria into it, that's fine. This is just a way, a process to do it, a way to get there, not the only way you can get all this information. So um, what I'm just showing you here today is here's some guides we've put together, some worksheets, some extra resources to help you get all all of this information um, and then put it into a document that then meets all those criteria that we say we think you should have um, in your plan in the end. So um, breaking up into small bits, uh, doing one step at a time so you're not so overwhelmed, um, we're hoping will be very helpful to you. Now we do also have some examples of some libraries plans here, some from previous years. Um, there are a couple of new ones that I actually mentioned at the end of the agenda for today. Uh, Lead Windside Public Library and Ponca Carnegie Library. Those are two brand new ones that I just put up from last year. Um, so these are all good examples of uh, community needs response plans. If you look at them, you'll see some of them are very different. Some have here that we put a picture of their library. Um, their mission statement, and then they just go jump right on into it, community profile. Some of them have a uh, table of contents. Let's see, Ponka just, I don't know where one that has a table of contents, I think. Yeah, Gothenburg has a whole table of contents for it. There's lots of different formats you can use to put together the plan. There's no right or wrong format. It's all about the content that is in there. As long as I can find those seven things and find them somewhere in your document, you'll be good to go. Now, to get started with this plan, 
Um, you've got our, these worksheets here and how to to guys extra things to help you out. As I said, these are just some things that you can use to help you work through the process. Uh, your planning team, you're going to want to plan and have a team of people together. Uh, I'm not going to go through every single one of these documents because um, they're all things you can look at, but I'm going to highlight the ones that I think are most useful and, and what you should definitely be, be looking at. As a library director, if you're a library director here, you do not want to go into this um, alone. You do not have to write this and work on this all by yourself. Have people help you. Uh, library staff and board members definitely, doesn't have to be everybody, definitely don't have it be everybody, but a few of them that you know would want to be involved in this. And then actually look outside the library. Communities, pe people in your community. Uh, oh, one of your, your library super users. Someone who comes in and uses the library regularly. Uh, who's they, so they know what's going on in the library. Someone who's a member of the church or the superintendent of the school or someone who you know might have some sort of a, <clears throat> you know, investment in you know, what's going on in the library. Maybe even someone who's not a library user. You know people in town, you talk to people, you know almost everybody and you know who's coming in and who's not. Talk to someone who is big in the community or someone who you know and say, hey, Will you come help us figure out how to get the library and get you in the library? What would help you come to use us? So get creative with that, but don't go it alone. We had one library who did do that, that I know of, and it was very stressful and, and, and a struggle for their staff. Um, this library director um, did it all on their own. They then moved on to a different library. They, they, they moved, uh, as happens, and their uh, staff came to one of my trainings last year, the year before, and I had no idea where to start. The director had done it all on their own. They didn't even have a copy of their plan. They didn't know how the director had come up with all this information. And they were basically just left left hanging, you know, with no idea what to go where to do. Don't do that. Have other people involved so that if you do go on to another library or another you know, something else, and that's fine, that happens, people will be still there and know what happened. So you don't want uh, how many people be involved will depend on how many people you have on your staff and your board and what's available. Uh, you want to have some communication at least, some you know back and forth um, discussions about things. So five people minimum is a good amount. This says up to twelve. I find twelve crazy <laughs> for myself, uh, but if you're a really large organization, that might work for you potentially. Um, so you're going to have to, you know, have these, you're going to have people that are going to have differing opinions and ideas, and then you will have to negotiate with them about, you know, agreements and, and uh, compromises and whatnot. So once you have, so you got your team together, and then you're gonna have all these other things you're gonna need to do: getting a community profile, your your demographic data, doing some surveys and things, doing the SWOT analysis, this and developing the goals. This is the kind of thing that you can then um, divvy up among those team members too. Not everybody has to do all of these things. The next things that come up to put together your plan, assign different people, a couple of people, the different parts of it. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the profile. This is your library demographics. We have a worksheet here that you can fill out to do. And it's just, this is basic information um, of what the kind of things that the U.S. Census data, um, the U.S. Census collects. So you do not have to fill in every single one of these numbers. This is just all the things you could um, look up to get an idea of what's going on demographically um, and the trends in your community. Uh, Lots of times in communities, you do have people who say, oh, there's tons of little kids around, everybody's having babies, or the population is aging, there's only old people and we need another senior center, or there's all these immigrants from certain groups come in, or all the immigrants have left and they're not here anymore. Uh, and that's great that people have their anecdotal ideas and, and, and think what they think, but census data is where you can verify if this is actually true. So you definitely want to get the numbers, get the statistics and data to make sure that what people claim is what's actually happening. Um, and once you do have this information, this will help you with those goals and programs you might like to institute. You may find out that, yes, there are tons of babies. There are 30% of our population is under the age of five. We need some more <laughs> toddler time or more story times or more kids programming. Now, we also have that in statewide figures. We update this with um, the state as a whole. So if you want to compare your community to the state, we'll pull together the state numbers for you. 
Um, this will probably be updated soon. Uh, Sam is working on statistics on the survey, and we'll probably have more recent data on here. But if you use the one that's there now and compare, that's fine. You don't have to wait till we put the newest one out. At whatever time, whatever's up here at the time you go and look at our website, it's fine to use. But it's all the same numbers just for the state as a whole. Now, where do you get this information? The U.S. Census data has online the um, American Fact Finder. Um, let's see here. We have, okay, that's what I wanted. Maybe facts. There we go. Um, where they have all of the data they've collected in the census. Now, this is a section of your plan that if you're working from your previous one, you definitely need to update these numbers. I do not want to see three-year-old data that you're working with. Now, we all know the U.S. Census, the full census is only done every 10 years, but in between censuses, they do do American community surveys and population estimates. So they do collect data in between full censuses. So you do have numbers and information here that is more up to date than the 2010 census. Um, especially right now, you don't want to use, we're going to be having a new census next year. Trying to base anything you do on 10-year-old data is not a good idea. You're not just not going to have anything that's really going to be useful because it's not going to be accurate. Um, and for what you're doing for your community, your plan that you're going to submit to me, I do not want to see the same numbers that you submitted three or four years ago. You, you're going to have, you go here and find the more up-to-date information. It's all broken down over here on the left side, age, education, housing, income, poverty level, race. All the information you need is broken down. If you go to a certain section, you see they've got the 2010 census, but then right here is the more up-to-date 2017, uh, at the moment, American Community Survey information. Now, you can search for your, your town here. Um, so who do we have? Um, 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 OK. I know I'm only I'm doing this because I saw that you were asking questions. So you can look up your community. Now you can see here when you start typing, and I'm not sure really what the reasoning is behind this. Sometimes it will automatically come up with your Nebraska, but sometimes you may have to add in Nebraska to get your our town here. So um, at Sydney, we're gonna look up Sydney's specific numbers. And you'll see once I search for that now, um, oh, I'm on the race area here. Let me go back to population, the main one. There we go. So it starts off here with the 2010 data, but if you just click down here instead, you will come up with the more up to date from the American Community Survey information that you can look at. And all right, we have a question. Let's see, does this. <laughs> No, I'm sorry, I won't. The, Andrew, the chairman, the director of Sydney Public Library, this is why I picked his, I saw his name come up in questions, wants me to fill those in for you. I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> uh, so, but we do have another question. Does this information need to be reflect the area represented by our funding source? For example, we're funded by tax dollars from our township. Good question. Um, it's going to depend on what you want to do, what data you want to collect. And that's actually something I was going to show here. You can see you can search by state, county, city, town, or zip code. And depending on what you put in um, here, you're going to get different numbers. So since I've got Sydney's up here, um, Sharon, what is the zip code for Sydney off the top of your head? Can you give that to me? And I'll show you how it different, um, what the difference is here. All right, six nine one six two. All right, so there, when you go by zip code, you'll see that comes up different for the population, and all the other demographics will be different as well. So there's going to be you can look for what is your city limits, what the census data has for there. Then, if you want to look at your zip code, that border is going to be different. And then, thank you, Sherm. If you even look at your county, um, let's see. There we go. Cheyenne County, Nebraska will give you different numbers. So you're going to want to use this data and, and search it depend, based on who you want to talk about in your plan, who you want to try and serve as your community. So um, 
if you're only saying we only just serve the people in our town look up your town and be done with it if you know people come in from the county as a whole even if you're not the official county library you may want to look at the county data if there's other towns that you know use your library for example we're so-and-so town but this town and this town to the east and west of us do not have a library so they come to us you may want to look at their data look up their towns so you're going to have to know ahead of time you know either who you already serve or who you might want to serve and look up that data now what you report to me is up to you and how much you dig into these numbers is up to you as well it depends on what you want to do with this information like I said, this community needs response plan is supposed to be something you actually use. Gathering all this information is not supposed to be just a chore and a, and a, and a fill in the blank because I have to type thing. I want you to be able to learn from it and use it and do something instructive with it um, afterwards. So think about what you want to do with this information to then decide what you're going to look up. Um, maybe just look up all the different things, all the different options, state, county, zip code, other towns around you that you know you use and see if anything, any sort of trends come up, see if you notice anything um, that you might want to you know, respond to that actually that town down the road from us has tons of little kids and doesn't have a library and needs help. Let's focus on so-and-so town. That's gonna be our new, our goal that we come up with. We're gonna institute a uh, traveling library of books that every month we'll bring to that um, daycare center in that town because they need the help. You know, you never know what might pop up from this. What you report to me, obviously just some general statistics about your, your own community, of course, to start with. But if you've decided that something else, county info, some other town's info is important to you, report on that as well. Um, let's see, we do have another question here. Let's see what we have. Will there be time to address how to reach non-library users and how to conduct successful meaningful surveys and focus groups? I will be talking about conducting surveys and focus groups. Yes, that will be coming up next. <clears throat> okay, so this is where you get all your data for your community survey. Now, you may have noticed if you read it when I first uh, logged into the America Fact Finder here, that there's a little notification up here. The uh, U.S. Census has decided that as of July, July 1st being when our accreditation application uh, form goes live and when our process starts, um, they're going to be changing where all this data is on their website. Uh, I wish they'd consulted with me <laughs> because through July 1st, this is where you will go. Starting July 1st, it will be this data.census.gov site. Um, it doesn't have a cool nickname like American Fact Finder. It's just census data, but that's okay. Um, it should be all the same numbers, just in maybe a slightly different format. Um, you see it's kind of fancy, flashier, a little more bells and whistles. I've got maps and visual visualizations and bar graphs and things. So trying to make it more useful to people. We can do the same sign of searching we did here. And there, actually... I just typing in Sydney, uh, this one did pop up automatically with Sydney City, Nebraska. And once it loads, it does take a little bit longer, I've noticed, for this to load. Um, they got a lot more, they have seem to have a lot more graphics and things on the page, um, or it may be because it's just new, I don't know. Um, but they've got some of the same information. You can go to different tables, demographic and housing information. And you can see here, this tells you you can go to the different years. So they've got the maps. Let's see, let's do the maps. So there's lots of different things that you can um, look at here. Uh, ideally, it's going to have the same numbers just in different places is what it's supposed to be. I'm going to try and get back to the main page again. There we go. Um, I want to see six. There. And so you can see here, you can do the zip code search, and it's going to gradually bring it up. So depending on when you go to gather your De uh, census data. You'll either have the American Fact Finder or you have this new census data.census.gov. 
<clears throat> doesn't matter to me which one you use. Um, if you do it before July 1st and grab the information from here, that's fine. If you're doing this after July 1st and it's the new site, that's fine. Um, I believe it does also say somewhere that, um, yes, when the new site goes live, it will have the 2018 American Community Survey data, so one year newer. Um, but that's okay, as long as you've got either 17 or 18, you know, whatever is newest on this page or newest on this page, depending on when you do it, is perfectly fine with me. <laughs> so I'm open to whichever. It just has to be different than what you had in your plan when you last submitted it, because definitely your numbers will have changed. Some might not, and that's okay. I, normally population does change, either up or down, something over three years, not drastically maybe, maybe not drastically enough to change your community's needs or goals or things, but definitely this is a section that you have to have updated in your plan to me. Let me get back to the page. All right. So that's your uh, community profile gathering your um, census data. Now community needs, this is looking at, um, this is going onto your community and doing surveys and focus groups and trying to gather information. <clears throat> now, if your community has already done something like this, we've had many people tell me that, well, you know, three years ago, our city did a survey, did a quality of life survey. That's fine. Use that data that's already been collected. <clears throat> um, don't reinvent the wheel, don't duplicate effort. If something has been done for me by the community as a whole in the last five years, that is acceptable. I don't want you to have to go crazy doing something that's already been done, it's already out there. Um, but if you do want to focus on some more specific things, you can do something in addition um, to supplement that data. Or if nothing has been done, then you do need to do some sort of surveying of it, of what you've done. So on this worksheet, we have different kind of methods you can use. And these are just a bunch of examples. You do not have to do all of these. Um, please don't do all of these unless you really want to. Um, but just a lot, some ideas. So a focus group, doing an open focus group where you just say to people, announce there's going to be an open meeting, a town hall type meeting at the library to talk about our community's needs. Uh, good to bribe people with food. They love to come for that kind of thing. Um, they may also, in all of these different weight surveys that you do, um, this is where you're talking about the community's needs, what's happening out in the community, what's happening in your town, in your area, not the library's needs. This is another part that can be kind of difficult for some libraries and the people coming to your events, coming to your focus groups or filling out your survey. They see this coming from the library and they want to start talking about the library. And that's fine. But what you're trying to do is gather information beyond what the library is doing, what's happening in the community. So to kind of let them get it out of their system, uh, I recommend start with some library questions, maybe what do you like, what do you think is going to library, but then get, start um, leaning, moving them towards questions about the community. Um, <clears throat> what do you think is going on in town? What do you like about the community? What don't you like about it? And lead, you may have, may have to lead them into that direction. So these focus groups, um, they may be difficult to run to. You might have someone who monopolized the discussion a lot. Uh, some people maybe are not as open with wanting to you know, talk publicly about things, um, but that's okay. You may need to do a survey. And this would be, you can do an anonymous survey. It does not have to have people saying who they are or anything. Um, a survey that you put on your website. Uh, some people do stick them in, um, the utility bills, everybody gets a bill from the, the water company or the phone company or something and being included in that. Put flyers around the town, have other organizations or group push out the fact that you're doing a survey. And now these survey questions, and we've got actually some sample survey questions right here. These are the kind of questions you're going to be wanting to ask in your focus group, on your survey, whenever you're talking to people. And this is where you can see these questions don't have anything to do with the library and that's the idea. Look what's going on in the community that a library might be able to do something with. So how satisfied are you living with? What do you like most? What do you like least? Um, I like this one. Would you recommend to your family or friends to come live here? Um, what's the most critical issue facing our community? And you're always talking about the community, not the library, in all these questions that you ask them. Um, so this is just some suggested questions. You may do more. Um, some of our example survey um, plans from some of our libraries do include their surveys. So if you want some more ideas for questions, we can you know provide that to you as well. 
Um, so a survey might be something that would be of use uh, for people that prefer to remain anonymous. Um, jumping back up here, key informant interviews. This is similar to doing a focus group, but with specific people. So rather than just doing an open call for anyone who wants to come and, and chat about what's going on in the community, um, this can work a little bit better than a survey or a focus group because you pick and choose who you want to hear from. People who have influence in your community, um, the superintendent in the school, um, parents who are virally involved in the community, religious group leaders, um, doesn't have to be open to everyone, so you can directly talk to these people and say, what do you need? What does your group need from our community? Um, what does the school really need the town to do? What does your church, what would be great for you that the town could do? Um, be, you know, be careful of leading them away from the library questions, but um, so that's another way that um, you can maybe get some really good information. And then just your own observations. Uh, you can just walk around. I mean, you know what's going on in your town. Just sit down and think about what do I know that's going on? What is everybody complaining about? What's going on? The goal is what's important. The goal is to collect um, this information and find out what people are thinking about what's going on in your community, um, not the method. So these are just a bunch of different ways that you can do that. Um, open call to bring in people who are not users um, or who are big users. Surveys that just go out to everybody in town so you may hopefully will get people who are not library users. Don't just sit your survey at your library and leave it. Bring it to other or, um, locations. Bring it to the grocery store, um, the local bar, uh, the beauty shop, wherever people gather. <clears throat> and then like I said, try and get it mailed out maybe if there is a local newspaper and they will include either the survey or a link to your survey if you do an online survey. Just say, here's the URL for our survey. Please pop over there and click the boxes and answer the questions that we um, ask of you. Now, in uh, not on our website, I think, but in, um, let's see, is there any focus groups? Yeah. Um, we also have some key informant questions. Um, so if you are doing, this is an example of that someone has done of, uh, this is like a, a pretend example of asking questions of certain people and the answers they give. So this can give you a kind of idea of the kind of questions um, you could ask of people when you're interviewing them. Um, so more questions and the kind of answers you might get back, um, which are just, you know, some great, just some ideas, ways to, you know, helping you lead you in, in you know, the kind of things you might, you know, Give you an idea of what kind of things you might add, answer so you can maybe lead them to those questions in your packet of information which is also available on the session page there is a you'll see the next page will have a, a uh, bar graph and a list here uh, this is something that was done in 2015 richard miller my predecessor looked at all of the community needs response plans that we received and um, read through them and kind of categorized things and the most common things that libraries, um, communities in Nebraska were um, talking about. And then there's a page where it just lists the most popular to least, least popular mentioned. So this is just also to give you an idea of what people might ask about or what things you might look at and look for in your community that might be going on that are problems. Um, business retention, youth-centered, non-sports related programming. Um, of housing, housing is a big thing. Not enough, too much, not good enough, not affordable enough. Um, sidewalk, street improvements, um, jobs. The pool needs work, we need a pool. The dog park needs work, we need a dog park. So many different things. This is just to give you an idea of what you might look at in your town if you can't get anyone to submit surveys, if you can't get anyone to answer your questions that at least can say well this is the kind of things going on in Nebraska and other communities maybe they're happening in ours as well uh, let's see we have another question here okay all right no you're not confused them okay the question here is I wonder when we can ask when okay I wonder when we can ask about library hours for the accreditation question if our survey needs to be focused on community need it seems to me that there is need to ask some library specific questions at some point that is true absolutely and you can have this survey you're doing or these interviews you're doing be a combination of things sure some specific library questions if that's a great way to get them to answer them and then some general about the whole community questions and that's fine um 
you could also do, I mean, this might be a lot separate surveys, one about the library and one about the community and promote them and do them in, as different things. That's um, an option. It is a little more work. Um, like I said, if they're your community, your county, um, your department of economic development, they already have done some sort of a quality of life survey. You don't have to redo that part at all. So actually ask around. We've had many communities that have, have been saying to our system directors or in classes, we didn't know that there was a survey done. Nobody even told the library that the county or the town or uh, the Chamber of Commerce has done something. And we found out not only had they done something, but they asked questions about the library. And the community was really supportive and, and uh, um, positive about the library. But nobody ever told the library it was on this thing. And nobody ever told the library what the answers were. So ask around to see if something has been done that you just maybe not heard of. And you might already have that part done. But I think also, like you did say, Deb, having a mixture of questions would be perfectly OK on this if you need to get answered questions about the library that you want to know but you want but also make sure you have those community questions so you have that part coming in as well and that is perfectly okay so you don't have to worry about being confused about it <laughs> mash them up together and you're fine <clears throat> now the next part of the uh, worksheet we have here is the wonderful SWOT analysis Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. This is the one where I mentioned that some people get confused because, let's try to close this other one. Um, we're talking, we separate them out and we talk about internal environment and external. Internal being all about the library, external being all about your community. So we've separated this out. We only want to hear about the strengths and weaknesses of your library and the opportunities and threats in your community in general. Um, like I said, any when you mentioned these in your plan, this this the um, community profile with the census data and the SWOT analysis are the two things that I most often send uh, these plans back to libraries to rewrite and to fix. The profile they've just you know only just have just done last the previous numbers that they have they didn't update them. The SWOT they've started mentioning things that in the external environment opportunities and threats about the library. So that's the two big stumbling blocks, the two biggest stumbling blocks in writing these plans. So specifically about the internal environment, about the library, you can see here we give you some examples of the kind of things to think about. Um, you're taking what you know about your library and then down here in the lower part about your community and trying to fit it into these boxes. What's a strength? What's a weakness? What's an opportunity? What's a threat? And then these will help inform your goals that you're going to come up with. Uh, this is the kind of thing you can just brainstorm in your library. Have your staff just brainstorm ideas. Uh, and this is something that sometimes libraries are have a hard time with uh, patting themselves on the back, say, saying we did great, we did good. So strengths, do that. Pat yourself on the back. What are the cool things we do? What's great about our staff and our volunteers? Um, what are the good things about our building? Um, do the technology, do we have the, the maker spaces? Uh, what services that we're offering? Our um, governance, is our library board great to us? You know, just think of all the good things that um, um, <clears throat> are going on. And then the weaknesses, this is also hard to be honest sometimes to yourself. Are our volunteers really not stepping up and doing what we need or what we ask them to? Uh, what are the horrible things about our building, which is probably the easiest <laughs> weakness to say. Our air conditioning is horrible, the, the, the toilets always back up, whatever. Uh, where you're lacking in technology or funding, um, your programming, are you not doing good, in re whatever. Be honest with yourself. Now this is something that your staff can brainstorm together. Um, if some of them want to also be anonymous with this, that might be a good idea too to get some, to be honest about things if you want to say, we're gonna, like a suggestion box. Just put in here what you think are our strengths and weaknesses. Don't have to identify yourself. That might be something, um, that, a good way to do it. Once you've got all that about your library, then you need to look out into your community. So this is where you don't mention the library at all. Some of the things you might think of that are opportunities and threats in your community, you might connect to the library. For example, um, technology. The internet is, um, horrible in the town so everyone comes to that and that's a well it could be an opportunity for the library they um the the internet is terrible in town so everyone comes to the library for their wi-fi to use the internet there that's great 
but you don't want to mention that library part. Just say this threat is there's no good internet anywhere in town. So that's what you've just got to think about what's going on. Now, if there is something that says, but the library can help fix that, that's where you get into your goals and your um, the strengths and weaknesses. That's when you do the library part. This part is just what's happening in the community. So we also have some things here to lead you in the right direction. Um, economy, are there as employers that are coming to town or leaving town? How is that affecting the community? Uh, the social climate, is there a new immigrant group in town? Is there one that's left? Um, how is the community um, relating to each other? Are there too many teenagers running wild in the streets and we need to create a program to keep them uh, occupied? You know, whatever is going on. So all of these things have to do with your town as a whole. Now, some of those community needs that you came up with from your surveys or your focus groups, that is what you can start pop, um, popping into those boxes about your community. These are the things that came up from our analysis from when we did those surveys and gathered that information. And now we know we can put them into these different spots in our um, boxes here. And then once you have all that information, that's when you come up with your goals and objectives. What are you going to do now with all this info? Uh, the worksheet we have here is just a basic. Let's switch it over. Uh, listing the three, like I said, three is what we ask for. Um, if you can only do two because of whatever reasons, that's okay. Um, definitely on a minimum of two, but three is a good number to come up with with some new ideas. And these goals that you're going to do, these things you're going to do, we're talking about doing these over the next three years. So not, oh my gosh, right now I have to do this thing to get my accreditation. No, this is a plan. So you're planning for what you're going to do. Your goal could say, in 2021, we are going to da, da 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 In 2020, we are going to do this, this, this. And that's fine. That's what we're talking about. Look to the future. Look in, in, at what you're going to be doing. The goals, we have a little sheet here about how to write your SMART goals. Uh, SMART is an acronym. Some of you may have seen this or heard of it or used it. Uh, that is um, the kind of things that you need to have um, accomplished when you've written your goals. It needs to be specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time-framed. So um, specific, something you're specifically doing. And this is going to be pretty easy. You can see here, answer the question, what has to be done? Looking at all those needs that we came up with, looking at what people are talking about, what do we need to do? Um, measurable. Um, how are you going to decide if it worked, if you did it? What is the frequency going to be? You know, how often is it going to happen? So your you know, thing that you're um, trying to do is the town, we need um, our local daycare centers don't have any books for the kids. So we are going to initiate a lending program to the daycare once um, and we will bring them books that they can then have for a month and then we'll go and pick them up and bring them back and bring them new books. So um, that's the, the, the thing that needs to be done is getting books into the daycare. Um, you're going to do it in a certain you know, amount of time. You're going to see how they use the books. It's attainable. Don't go crazy. Don't say we are going to um, go to every single daycare in our town and the three towns around us and bring them all the books. that you, know, you Don't go overboard. <laughs> Make sure you don't scare your staff away. Uh, something you can actually do. Um, relevant. This is going to be, if you're working off of all that information you've gathered, that's going to make it relevant. You looked at the community, you've seen the demographics of the kind of people that are in your town, you've seen them complain about different things, you made it relevant by using that information. And then time frame, when are you going to do this? In 2020, we are going to initiate a lending program, and then we will go there once a month and transfer out the books. And who is going to do it? Um, our children's librarian or our this volunteer or whoever is going to do it. Um, there are uh, some things you can use as you're looking at your these different parts, um, questions to answer to decide if you're writing this usefully. And the idea is these goals and objectives are something to be uh, need to be useful to you, something you can actually do, something you want to do, something that you can actually pull off, basically. Um, so you can look at all these different things here just as you're thinking about these goals. Do I meet, have I met all these kind of criteria or some of these things that are on here? Now, these goals that you're coming up with, um, I've had a questions asked of me about the goals. People have been doing, you know, the previous um, plan, they had some goals. Uh, you may have completed some of those projects. That's great. On to new things. 
you may have some of those still ongoing um, as an ongoing goal or we tried it it worked okay but we need to tweak the program because it didn't work out as well as we wanted to that can be your current your new goal in this new plan you can take a previous thing you've done and say it didn't work exactly right and we want to try again so this is still the same issue right now in our town. It's only three years later. This is still an issue. We want to try again. So here's how we're going to do it again. Um, you can fail at these goals. Failure is a great learning experience. and That's perfectly acceptable. You can say, we tried this thing. It failed completely. And we are going to completely revamp it and start over. We're not going to continue and tweak it. It's just we're going to try something totally new. And that can be one of your goals. So you can have some of your previous goals be your new goals and your new plan if you want to, if you need to, because of what you're going to do with it. But try to at least come up with at least one new thing, something you didn't do before, based on all that information that you gathered, based on the prof census data you looked at, the community needs you um came up with from your surveys and your interviews, and then when you took all this and did this whole SWOT analysis, come up with at least one new one, at least, hopefully, that you've, that you've um, realized is something that you could um, work on. Now, as you're going through doing all these needs and these surveys and all this, you're gonna come up with a long list of things, like that list that was of all the things that were going on in the different libraries um, that we came up with before. You're gonna come up, with there it is a long list of things um many of them things that you as a library cannot do anything about and that's okay in your plan just report here's the top 10 things that people are complaining about but as a library here's the only two that we can do anything to we can help do create a new lending program we can just like that article about harford we could host a meeting and be the place where they can all come and talk about something doesn't even necessarily need to be providing a library service as the end result, but just being serving the community's needs and something they need. This is where libraries today are thinking about outside the box, are providing lending of things that you'd never have thought of before, um, are participating in things and providing things that are not completely untraditional. Um, and, and that's what we're, we're looking for and hoping that you can discover in your communities is things that you never would have thought of before by going through this process and making it part of your regular um, library service. Um, lastly, um, do your evaluation. We've got a little question here, questions here. Um, who will evaluate on your team? What's the purpose? When? Um, many of my plans say once a year at a particular um, board meeting, the library board will look over the, this plan, the community needs response plan, and make sure we're on schedule for what we said we would do. So you could say every August at the August board meeting, they will look at it. Now, throughout the year, the library and the library staff will be using the plan to do those particular little projects um, and developing them more. But the evaluation will be the board or you, library staff and director, just checking in to make sure, do we do it? Are we on schedule? How's everything working? Are we ready for next year's goal and new project that we're going to do? All right, and once you have all of those and have them written up into something, you should be you have something that is um, acceptable and will be approved by me and useful um, for you. I hope <laughs> that is the ultimate, um, you know, result of this whole thing. These goals is what you're really going for, trying to find something new you can do in your community, something you can do to um, help serve them and keep your face out there, keep them thinking of the library as something that they can use. All right, so uh, any other, any questions about any of that? Any other questions you have about the different processes? Um, did anybody ask anything and um, I didn't explain as clearly as you wanted? Something you wanted a little bit more about? Uh, please go ahead and type into your GoToWebinar question section and I will answer them. Um, I do recommend taking a look at the example plans we have here. As I said, it's perfectly fine. Use some other library's format to create yours. Use your previous plan if you are re-accrediting as a basis for your current for your new one. Make sure you change the particular things that have to be different. Your community profile, demographic data needs to be different. Um, your uh, 
community needs and SWAT may be different, may be the same. It has only been three years. Um, some things don't change over that short a period of time, uh, and that is okay. That will be something you can actually say in your plan. We've discovered that our community is still having a problem with this, 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 and this. But there's this one new thing. Uh, there may be some things that have been resolved. Three years ago, we needed a, a pool, and now it's in place. Awesome. Now, how do we work with that? <laughs> so, no other questions that you need to ask me right now? All right. Um, that is, will um, then wrap it up for our workshop this afternoon. Uh, uh, that's um, everything about the community's response planning. Um, this is all about getting your library's accreditation. So start right now working on that plan. Um, if you haven't already, um, work on updating your previous one, writing a new one. If you have a draft that you want me to look at and while you're in process still, that is perfectly fine. Send it to me. I can evaluate. I can you know, give you some tips as you're in process. Your uh, system directors, your, your regional library system directors um, can also help with that. Um, Eric M. Jones, the Western Library System, Scott Childers in the Southeast, Denise Harders in Central, and um, Jan Jolliffe out in Western, they can all help you as well with any of your plans that you're writing. Um, this can be an ongoing process between us until you get down to what you want to actually submit. Once you have your plan submitted and your accreditation form submitted, then as I said, I will start evaluating them and I will come back to you. July 1st is when the form goes live, so you can start working on that. October 1st is the deadline to submit both things, to submit both your plan and your, and your uh, online form. Those two things I have to have by October 1st. Then um, after I have both of them, I'll start looking at them. By December 31st, everyone will be um, informed about if you've been accredited and at what level. Um, between the time you submit and end of the year, we may have back and forth. If I have questions from you, if you have updates to me, um, there may be some back and forth before I get you your final answer. Um, but anytime after July 1st, when that form goes live, you can submit to me. Um, if you send me something July 2nd and you're all good, then that's cool. I'll start looking at it then. You might have your answer very early, <laughs> um, but ultimately October is a deadline. Now, if you are unable to meet any of these deadlines, let me know. We can give you extensions. As I said at the very beginning, this is not a program dictated to us by ALA or anyone else or IMLS. We run it here from the commission. I'm in charge of the program, and um, if I need, if you need, if you have extending circumstances, we can give you an extension. We've given a few months extension to some libraries who are very busy. I've given a whole year extension to libraries. Um, if there's a, if you're a brand new director and you're coming into this totally cold and have no idea what you're doing, let me know. Don't panic. This is not. I have all the things you need to learn as a new director. This is well, something that can be put off for a year, and you can try. You know, can, we can extend your accreditation one more year and have you do it next year. Um, we've had libraries who had some construction done um, when they were either expanding a building, building a new library, doing renovations, and if that's happening during the, the summer accreditation period, just let me know that you can't get this done too, and I'll give you another year on your um, um, accreditation as well. So we can do that as uh, if you need to. You just need to keep in touch with us about these kind of things. If you're struggling, just keep in touch with me and we'll make sure we try and get you through the process. All right, so any other last minute questions that you have about accreditation or community needs response planning or surveying, surveying? Yeah. I'm watching to see if any type anything. All right, all right. Um, then that will wrap it up for our workshop today. Um, we are recording it and will be posted onto our website. I'll say tomorrow. Um, as you can see here, we have a recorded online session um, from last year. After this one, um, when this is all processed, that'll be updated for this year's um, recording. So you have the 2019 up to date information. All right, so call me, email me. You guys know where to find me here at the Library Commission and we'll get you all through the process. All right, thanks very much for everyone for attending. Bye-bye and good luck.